So the word I want to talk about today is xenophobia. The word has its roots in ancient Greek. On the one hand, there's phobos, related to phobia, meaning fear. And then there's xeno, xenos, meaning stranger or foreigner. And altogether, the word translates as fear of strangers or dislike, distrust of foreigners. And I find the word quite important because I think when we look at the darkest chapters in human history, including the Holocaust, it did not start with gas chambers or concentration camps or neighbors putting a mark on other neighbors' doors just because they think they are different to them. All of that came much later. I think the darkest chapters in human history started with words. How we talk about the other, how we refer to people whom we do, we do not regard as part of us, we, is incredibly important, you know, including the jokes we crack, the, the words we choose. So xenophobia, I think, is an important word to understand the age we're living in. And we need to look at not only the definition of the word, but at the many ways in which it is being used and perpetuated today. As I mentioned, it is an old word that goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Then they, they, for instance, when they talked about anyone who did not exactly fit into their own definition of we, including Egyptians, Phoenicians or Persians, they would use the word barbarians. Or, for instance, the ancient Romans, when they referred to the Greeks, they also used a similarly uh, similar approach that distanced themselves from the Greeks and emphasized that they were better than the Greeks. So this concept of saying us is better than them is actually quite old. That's what I'm trying to say. But it's interesting that the word xenophobia, even though the concept is quite old, the word itself is modern. Because when we look at, at when it was used in written texts, it goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. As far as we know, the first time it was used in written culture, written text, was in 1903. And I find it also quite interesting that in the year 2016 and onwards, it was repeatedly chosen the word of the year by many digital platforms. Why? Because it's so important to understand this age. And unfortunately, there's so much that the word reveals about the times we're living in. Before I go any further, I want to make a distinction between xenophobia and racism. Although they go hand in hand, and oftentimes they overlap, they're not exactly the same thing. In racism, you believe in the superiority of one race vis-a-vis -vis another. In xenophobia, there is this fear of anyone who looks, you know, different. But of course, they can, they can overlap very easily. And there are lots of examples of that. There are studies that show today if your name or surname is foreign sounding, when you apply for a job, that affects the chances of you getting a job interview. You know, so there are many different ways of discriminating against people, some of them more overt, but other ones, uh, others much more subtle. Two things I want to underline here. In xenophobia, there's this emphasis that us is different than, you know, them. But then there's this also notion that within us, there are some people who are different. So it operates as a weapon against minorities. Anyone who is regarded as different because of the color of your skin, because of your sexual orientation, anything, you know, can be a reason for that otherizing, distancing. And did we not see this recently after the football game when, you know, young football players who have given everything to the game uh, and whom we should all be very proud of, they were subjected to this horrific uh, racism online, but also offline. And actually... Um, there's something that many black players tell us, not only in the UK, but across the world. They're saying, you know, when we score a goal, we become part of us. But the moment we miss a goal, we are immediately regarded as them. Um, so we need to unpack all those layers, in my opinion. What Nelson Mandela told us, I believe, is very important. He used to say, nobody is born hating another person because of the color of their skin, because of their religion, because of their background, which means we learn racism. We learn xenophobia. 
And that's the sad truth about the societies we're living in. But there is a silver lining in that sad truth. If we learn xenophobia, it means we can also unlearn it. Just being aware of it, talking about it, making it visible, and listening to people who are feeling the burden, you know, who are being the target of xenophobia, who are on the receiving end of racism and xenophobia, listening to what they're telling us, I think is incredibly important. There's, a, there's an example I want to share with you, which I think uh, cl clarifies and illustrates everything that I've been talking about. There was a very powerful artwork recently, perhaps you have seen it. It was called The List. And this is an artwork that is produced by a um, women artist, by a Turkish female artist, Banu Cennetoğlu. And in that list, she one by one mentioned the names, surnames um, of every refugee who lost their lives as they were trying to come into Europe. If I'm not mistaken, in the year 2018, her list, the list that she had compiled, you know, brought together painstakingly with much love, that list... Uh, embodied around 34,000, 35,000 names. Of course, since then, the number has even grown. And this important artwork wanted to show people, you know, to give a name to those people who have been dehumanized constantly. I think this is what art needs to do, literature needs to do, to rehumanize people who have been systematically dehumanized. And that's what this uh, precise work of art was doing. And it traveled many cities and countries. But when it came to Liverpool, which is an amazing city, which is a wonderful city known for being inclusive and diverse. But in Liverpool, the, the artwork that I'm talking about was vandalized twice. And the artist, interestingly, did not want to replace or repair the artwork because, in a way, I think she very rightly said that I want people to see because this is a reminder of what the refugees are actually going through, you know, just seeing this vandalized artwork. But the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because something that really struck me at the time and that stayed with me very vividly in my memories. The second time, I think, the artwork was vandalized. Someone had written a very xenophobic graffiti, you know, on the list of the names of dead refugees. And it said, invaders, not refugees. So those, you know, words that we're using, invaders, invasion, infesting, vermin, how we speak about the other is incredibly hurtful, harmful, and this is how xenophobia comes to the surface. At the end of the day, I think awareness is important, as I mentioned, but also stories are important. Because when we know the other's stories, when we know multiple stories about the other, then we can't make generalizations so easily. Then we can't just see them as numbers. Because I think there is a lot of connection, you know, there's more than rhythm and rhyme between numbers and numbness. Just looking at num numbers makes us numb. We don't feel it. But if I know the stories of each and every person who lost their lives, if I know their names, their surnames, their age, their stories, then things become different. So knowing and sharing the stories does two things, in my opinion. On the one hand, it breaks this idea that the other is a monolithic, homogenous whole, and you realize the plurality of voices, actually, in the other. But the second thing that it does is to show us the similarities, how close I am to those people that I thought were different than me. It shows us that the other is actually my brother, the other is my sister, the other is me, I am the other.